All right, now we're locked in the first half of the course, which is where I'm going to teach you mainstream philosophy of mind. I'm going to teach you what other philosophers think is the important stuff in the philosophy of mind. And I think a lot of it is important, but I think the really important stuff comes in the second half of the course when I try to tell you uh, how the mind actually works and how it relates uh, to the brain uh, in some uh, detail. But <clears throat> that comes later. Now we're still locked in the debates that follow essentially uh, the uh, rejection of Cartesianism. If you reject Cartesian dualism, uh, as most people do, I, then what is the, what is a rational position to adopt? Now, the, the contemporary orthodoxy is some form of materialism. Uh, it, and materialism is sort of the religion of our time in, in, the, in the sciences of the mind, that is to say, in the philosophy of mind, in uh, cognitive science, in psychology, and in the other social sciences. Some type of materialism is just generally accepted, and the idea is somehow to make it consistent with what we otherwise know. And at the, in the last lecture, I went through uh, the different forms of materialism that were influential in the last half of the 20th century, and many of which continue to be influential today. Uh, we went through behaviorism, both analytic behaviorism and methodological behaviorism. I think behaviorism is now pretty much discredited. Uh, there are self-confessed behaviors still running around. I guess Dan Dennett counts as a uh, behaviorist. Uh, in fact, he says he is, so uh, that's a fair enough uh, uh, characterization. But there aren't an awful lot of behaviorists left, and I think even in uh, psychology, there are very few professors who would get up in front of a class and say, psychology is a science of human behavior. Uh, they used to say that for a long time because they were embarrassed to say science is the, uh, psychology is a science of the mind, which is what I think it is, because that sounded, my God, you're back in bed with Descartes, you know, the mind, as if it were some kind of a separate entity. Well, I think psychology is the science of the mind, and cognitive science is a type of psychology, so I'm going to be talking about the foundations of cognitive science uh, when we get to it. Okay, so the idea then was that some sort of materialist conception of the mind, it isn't the behavior, but it's the brain, which is the basis of the mind. The essence of the mind is the brain. And then the idea is to get some form of what's called identity theory, uh, that the mind just is identical with the brain, <coughs> that mental states just are identical with brain states. And the uh, favorite examples were always embarrassingly bad neurobiology. The favorite example was pain is C-fiber stimulation. I'm embarrassed to tell you that because it's, it's worse than bad philosophy. It's bad brain science. Uh, C-fibers are a type of axon. Uh, and uh, they are different from uh, alta, uh, 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 delta A fibers, which carry a different type of signal. One of them is myelinated and the other is not myelinated, and the myelinated axons carry the signal faster than the unmyelinated ones. And one of them is more uh, common with aching, burning sensations, and the other, go with, uh, the other type of axon tends to go with a, a sharp pricking sensation where you can localize where the pain is exactly. Uh, but I, it's unintelligent to identify pain with, with a type of axon, which is an anatomical feature of neurons. However, the basic uh, uh, impulse remains even after the bad neurophysiology is removed. And the basic impulse is to say, well, when you're in pain, you're in a certain type of brain state. And that brain state is necessary and sufficient for pain. Now, there's, a mean, there's an immediate example, and that is it looks like, yeah, but if you're going to say that that is an identity that you can discover, the way you discover that water is identical with H2O, then there's got to be two different sets of properties uh, on each side of the identity statement. The water properties and the H2O properties, or the evening star properties and the morning star properties, whatever is your identity statement. So if you're going to say pain, this feeling, is identical with this state of the brain, 
uh, then it looks like you got pain properties and brain properties, and that looks like property dualism. Now, when I used to argue with these guys, they always would say, well, we're going to get rid of those mental properties. It's going to turn out that they are really uh, something else. And I mentioned some of the uh, strategies they had for doing that. The idea was, well, we can talk about them in a topic-neutral vocabulary. We don't have to use a Cartesian vocabulary. Uh, that seems to me beside the point. They, they're still there, uh, even if you don't mention them. I, I mean, you can't get, get <coughs> Uh, uh, away from them by refusing to talk about it. You know, you don't deny the existence of airplanes just by saying, well, we're not going to mention airplanes. We're going to talk about the properties owned by United Airlines and American Airlines and so on. The, the airplanes are still there. The, the irreducible mental phenomena are still there. So the aim is to get a kind of reductionism, is to show, well, really, uh, the mental states can be reduced to something else. So the difficulties of type-type identity, and you, I won't repeat all those difficulties again, but one of the most powerful difficulties was type-type identity looks like neuronal chauvinism. You don't want to say, in order to have a pain, a system has to have a certain type of axons, because who knows what kind of pains exist among animals that don't have that type of axon. I have a friend who does research on termites, uh, and termites have a much simpler nervous system. Uh, they've only got about 100,000 uh, neurons, so they're easier to study. Now, I figure I lose 100,000 neurons on a big weekend, so I don't, I don't know what kind of mental life uh, the, the damn termites have. But no one wants to say, well, the termite can't suffer a pain because it hasn't got my type of axon. So we got to avoid neuronal chauvinism, uh, and that means we've got to have token identity. Now, I want everybody to understand this. Type-type identity says every mental state of a certain type is identical with a neurobiological state of a certain type. They like to put this in a sloppy way by saying mental state types are identical with brain state types. That's wrong. That's not the right way to put it. Rather, it's every token of a certain type is identical with a token of a certain uh, a mental state type. So we, uh, we get type identity identifies the types of mental with types of the neurobiological. But now the token identity is a weaker thesis. What it says is, look, for every mental state, there's some damn physical token or other that it's identical with, but we don't say that it always has to be the same, uh, it has to be a token of the same type of physical states because we don't want to exclude the possibility uh, that you can build machines that are conscious. We don't want to exclude the possibility that alligators are conscious but have a different kind of neurobiology from the kind that we have. So token identity looks like it's the way to go. And I think most identity theorists today are token identity theorists. I don't know anybody. Well, I shouldn't say that, because then there's always somebody who will uh, point out to me that there are some. So there must be some running around the woods. Uh, but the basic form of the identity theory today is token identity. Every mental state you have is identical with some damn token or other of a neurobiological state in your brain. So if I believe Denver's the capital of Colorado, and you also believe that, then there'll be something going on in my brain which is identical with that uh, belief, and something going on in your brain. But the neurobiology of what you have needn't be the same as the neurobiology of what I have. Okay, everybody's got that. That seems reasonable. I'm, I'm sympathetic to these guys. But then you got a question. What fact makes them both the same mental state. Now notice that's a serious question for them because we both have exactly the same belief, but there's nothing there to the belief except the neurobiology, but the neurobiology is different. So what makes it the same? See, the Cartesian says, well, it's the same conscious thought. I'm busy thinking, Denver's the capital of Colorado, and you're having the same conscious thought. Uh, and, the, and the type identity theorist says, well, there's the same neurobiological structure. But the token identity theorist can't say that because he wants, the token identity theorist wants to get rid of irreducible mental phenomena. 
and, and wants to deny that there is a type identity between the mental states and the physical states. So what is the token identity theorist going to say in answer to the question, what fact about different physical tokens makes them tokens of exactly the same type of mental state? And that answer has to be given without mentioning anything mental. Now comes a major breakthrough, and this is what I think most philosophers believe today, and it's called functionalism. And functionalism says, well, what makes them tokens of the same type is they perform the same function. And what is a function? A function is a set of causal relations. And I showed you briefly how they did that last time. You say what causes the belief, let's say uh, the, the belief that it's raining. Well, the perception that P, that it's raining, causes, I wrote an arrow last time, but let me write out the word, causes the belief that P. And then you also want to say the belief that P, together with the desire that Q, let's say the desire to stay dry, causes an action, causes action A. OK, now then, we can say anything that stands in those causal relations is the belief that it's raining. So you knock out the reference to a specific belief, and you just put in a variable. There is some x such that x uh, sorry, I, I had the wrong the perception here. The perception that P, I, you just say there's some X such that the perception of the P causes X, and the X together with the desire that Q causes action A. And of course, this is just a sketch. We'd have to have maybe thousands of such causal relationships uh, answering the question, what do you do under certain counterfactual situations? But the idea is anything that stands in the right causal relations, it's caused by the perception that it's raining. And together with the desire to stay dry, it causes you to carry an umbrella. Anything is the belief that it's raining. It can be anything at all. A, a provided it stands in the right causal relations. So one of the objections to behaviorism, namely it can't explain the fact that the mental states function causally, that's removed immediately. Mental states are defined by their causal relations. And if you say, yeah, but you still got the desire, the cue, we get rid of that too. Uh, that's going to be analyzed in terms of its causal relations. That's just a why. So there's some why. And there's some x, such that the perception of p causes x. And x together with y uh, I causes, I, you say there's some x and some y, such that the perception that p causes x. And x together with y causes action A, and so on. You analyze the desires the same way you analyze the beliefs. And if you're really going to get hard-nosed about it, you do the same with the perception. The perception is itself a mental state. It has, stands in, it's caused by certain types of, of uh, neuronal stimulations of your, uh, uh, of your perceptual system. Uh, the photons strike uh, the retina. They strike the photoreceptor cells. So the idea is. The mind consists in a set of causal relations, and those causal relations can be specified in a way that's neutral about the physical substructure. Now, that's a great idea, because that allows for the next great revolution, the next great breakthrough. We want to know what these, how these causal mechanisms work. How does it actually work in real life? And the answer is, they are computational states of a computer system. What is a belief, really? It's a certain type of computational state in your belief program. And when the belief program is implemented in your brain, but it could be implemented in any physical system. Any physical system that is rich enough and stable enough to carry the hardware to carry the software, that is, to carry the program uh, for having beliefs and acting on beliefs, any physical system can have a mind. 
And that leads to the idea, well, really, what are we really? <clears throat> Descartes thought we're really Cartesian souls. Uh, the behaviorists thought were really systems of behavior. Uh, the type-type uh, identity thought were really neurobiological structures. And the next great breakthrough was to say, we're really computers. Or rather, we are computer programs that happen to be implemented in this icky wetware in the brain. Now, believe me, there are guys out there who still believe this. There's a guy named Ray Kurzweil who says the next great step in human evolutions is we're going to get out of this messy crap that we carry around in our skulls and get into some decent hardware. Uh, we're going to be we're going to keep we we're going to be downloaded or maybe it's uploaded. I never know which direction we're going to be uh, uploaded onto a decent piece of hardware uh, so we can get out of this junky thing we carry around, uh, this icky thing in the skull, and we're now going to be, he says, immortal, because we will be in decent hardware. We'll be on hard disks. Now, he says, uh, you've got problems. Nobody wants to spend their life as a desktop. Aha! <laughs> but, he says, we're going to have a different kind of body. Instead of going around in this icky body that we have, we're going to have a different sort of physical structure altogether. Now, Ray is a bit hesitant to tell you what the body's going to look like. But I remember a movie I once saw uh, where the hero was told, consider plastics. Uh, consider plastics. So we're going to have plastic bodies. And now here comes another magic word by nanotechnology. Uh, plastics by nanotechnology with a decent hardware are going to enable us to achieve immortality. But suppose running around your plastic body, you're run over by a truck, the whole thing, you're crushed. No worry, because you've got a backup disk. <laughs> the backup disk can just be plugged into a new body, and you're off and running, literally. Now, Ray admits you've got to make frequent backups. Because uh, if you don't make frequent backups, you'd have to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. I guess you'd have to get divorced again, uh, uh, or, or you'd have to break up with your boyfriend again, or whatever. You'd have to do this. Now, I, I'm not inventing this. I actually reviewed this guy in the New York Review of Books. Nice guy, and he's very smart. Uh, and you can look at his books on the subject. He keeps sending me many copies, obviously, because he wants me to give them away to my students. Uh, but in any case, you can uh, check him out. I am not parodying Ray's views at all. His name is Ray Kurzweil. He is an extreme version of the computational theory of the mind. And you might say, well, it's a kind of reductio ad absurdum of the computational theory of the mind. However, I haven't criticized this stuff yet. I'm just telling you what it is. Uh, so but if you're interested in this, I, I, I did review his book in the New York Review of Books, and you can probably find it online, or if you can't, I'll, I'll put my review. Uh, I can, if somebody remind me, I'll put it on, on B-Space. OK, so now we're up to the point where the functionalist says, we want to know the nature of the mechanism that implements uh, this set of causal relations. And at long last, we have discovered it. It's a computer. And the brain, we just happen to be implemented in uh, the wetware of the brain. But any system at all that is capable <laughs> of implementing the program could have a mind in exactly the same sense that you and I have minds, because that's what a mind is. It's an implemented computer program. I debated a guy once on British television, and he said, we are creating minds. Well, think about it. He sits there, and he programs in Lisp all day. And at the end of the day, he's got a mind on the program. He, he's, uh, he has created a mind. Well, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Uh, my wife was brought up a, 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 up a Catholic. Uh, I, I, she's an atheist now. But she heard that, and she said, that's a sin. That's a, <laughs> that's a sin to say that. Um, but in any case, uh, whatever else you can say about these guys, it's kind of interesting. And I had a lot of fun debating them. 
Uh, it's one of the few things, well, I won't say one of the few things, but it is a type, it's an issue where I was pretty damn well convinced that I was right and these guys were wrong, but I haven't told you what the issue yet, so let me make the case for them. I will not have done my job if I don't make this sound plausible. So I'm now going to tell you the intellectual underpinnings, and all of the stuff I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes is stuff you should know as educated citizens of the 21st century. It's part of the intellectual culture you live in. So I'm now going to give you the background for the computational theory of the mind, and a lot of it is essential to the theory of computation. It has to do with what a computer is and how the computer works and why it is such a powerful uh, type of mechanism. So I'm going to introduce a whole lot of crucial notions. OK, any questions before we do that? Yeah. Yes. What it you see here was that that is the objection uh, that is made uh, to uh, the uh, identity theorist that says, well, really, it is a type of property dualism, because if you're going to say that uh, there's an identity statement that you can discover in the same way you discover that lightning is an electrical discharge, water is H2O, the evening star is the morning star. Those are the favorite examples of identity statements. In each of those cases, you have two different sets of properties. In order to say that A is identical with B, you got to have some A properties over here and some B properties over here. And it looks like you're going to have to say, well, there are the mental properties, the pain, it hurts. And then there are the physical properties. It's a C-fiber stimulation. And if you've got two different sets of properties, that's property dualism. Now, what those guys invariably said, well, with one exception, what they said was, we're going to get rid of the mental properties. We're going to show that those really are physical properties, too. So in the end, it was, a, it was like earlier versions of materialism. One exception was a guy in Minnesota. I only discovered his work uh, after he was dead, unfortunately. His name is Grover Maxwell. And Maxwell says, who knows, we might discover uh, that all of these glorious psychological features we have, we're appreciating the spring morning or uh, rejoicing in romantic poetry, that is that those irreducible mental uh, states, uh, irreducible mental properties that are identical with physical properties. And that's more like my view. I'm going to say something not so different from that. But the early, the early uh, defenders of token, of both type and token identity theorists said there aren't any irreducible Cartesian properties. And if you believe there are, you're in bed with Descartes. Or as David Armstrong said to me, you believe in spooks. If you don't think you can get rid of uh, these uh, irreducible mental phenomena, then somehow or other there's some sort of superstition. Yes? Okay, here is, uh, there are two sets of problems. One is a behaviorist problem. If you had a machine that behaved exactly uh, like I do, uh, would that machine have the same mental states that I have? And the answer uh, to that, by, given by the behaviorist, is yes, because that's all there is to having the mental states, is behaving in a certain way. And this was uh, also characterized, the computer functionalists that we're going to get to now, because what they said is, look, if the, mach if the machine can do exactly what a human can do, it can write poetry and it can so speak Chinese and do all the things a human can do, then you have to say that it has the same psychological states as the human, because otherwise you're, there's some mystery, some mystification, some uh, irrationality in your view. Now, the question you ask, though, is a tougher question, and that is, are they token identical? And the answer these guys would give, no, you could, I think they'd have to say, they're, they're ident like identical twins. If you, you might make a system that was uh, identical with me in its behavior, in its capacities, then it would have the same mental capacities I do, but it wouldn't actually be me. It would be uh, an identical twin uh, 
uh, to me. Now, Ray has a problem, and that is, well, what thing, what makes it me if the machine got, if the machine got run over by a truck and we put in a new uh, uh, disk uh, that had all the same programs on it? And he has an answer to that, but I forget what it is. Look him up. He's, he's, he has fun defending his views. They're not, they don't seem very plausible to me, and I, I'm glad I don't have to defend them. But look up Kurzweil on, on uh, Google and see what he says about that question. I know he has an answer to that. I just forget what it is. Okay, here we go. We're going to go to work now, and now I'm going to give sort of set-piece lecture on several absolutely fundamental notions that aren't just important for philosophy, but they're important for your general education. All right, the first you're probably familiar with already, and that's the distinction between syntax and semantics. Syntax has to do with form. Semantics has to do with meaning. Now, the point, however, is that in any linguistic uh, realization, the meaning always has to be carried by some form. It has to be carried by a sentence or a sequence of symbols. There has to be some syntactical entity which is the bearer of the meaning. Syntax is form, semantics is meaning. And you, you know that you need a distinction because the same form I, 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 the same meaning can be carried by different forms. We say in English, it's raining, but in French you say, il pleut, in German you say, es regnet, and so on in other languages. In each case, you have the same semantics, it's raining, but you have a different syntax. The syntactical form in English is, it's raining, I, in, in French and German, it's I, il pleut and es regnet. Incidentally, it's an, it's an interesting feature of English that it has this weird tense, uh, the, the, the present continuous. It is raining. We can't say it rains. Uh, it rains is, uh, uh, is ungrammatical. You have to add something. It rains too often in England or something like that. You can do that. But just it rains, the dramatic present is odd uh, in English. But that's, that's a footnote. The point I want you to get across now is you must make a distinction because the same semantics can be carried by different syntax. And of course, you all know the same syntax can carry different semantics. I went to the bank can be ambiguous between I went to the side of the river and I went to the finance house. So you've got a distinction between syntax and semantics. I cannot tell you how important this is, uh, but I'll just give you a hint. And the hint is that though we think logical relations are about semantics, in fact, you can get syntax to do almost all of the work. In ordinary English, if you hear the sentence, if it rains tonight, the ground will be wet tomorrow. It will rain tonight. You hear that as implying the ground will be wet, wet tomorrow. And you're all familiar with that form of inference. You have rain, if rain, then wet. And you have the extra premise rain. And so you can draw the conclusion wet. Now, all of that, as I've given it to you, is, is semantics encoded in a syntax. But a very great uh, a thinker, Aristotle, discovered, well, you can forget about the specific examples here and just use the if P then Q, or the all and some. So if you have if P then Q and P, then you can derive Q, and that's got a name that's called the law of modus ponens, and it's said the derivation now is said to be formal because it works in virtue of the form of the if p then q and p structure. It works in virtue of the syntactical form, and you don't have to worry about the meanings of p and q. However, in Aristotle, you still have to worry about the meanings of if and then and all and some. The next step is to say you can get rid of all of the ordinary English sentences here and just put in symbols, uh, symbols that are otherwise meaningless. You have P arrow Q and P, and you program your computer so that whenever it sees P arrow Q and 
uh, P over Q and P, it prints out Q. Now notice, those operations are now purely over syntactical elements. We didn't have to worry about the meanings of if and then and 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 so on. We just had a bunch of syntactical elements, and we had a program that operates on the syntactical elements and generates an answer. It, that is a prodigious intellectual achievement, and the, the message of it is, where logic is concerned, you can forget about the semantics and let the syntax do the work. If you get the right match between the semantics and the syntax at the beginning, when you state your premises and you follow your rules right, the rules are purely syntactical now, they operate on the syntax, you'll get the right semantics out at the end. You'll get at the end, uh, the ground is wet, and that's what uh, is implied by the set of premises. I said, with very few exceptions, you can forget about the semantics. The syntax will do all the work. And why is that important? Because that's what the computer is going to do. It's going to manipulate symbols. Uh, I said there are exceptions, and the famous exception is Gödel's theorem. And I won't tell you about that, because I'm going to tell you so much crap already this morning. I don't want to overburden you. But Gödel's theorem shows, uh, well, there are things uh, that are semantically right, but you can't prove. There are truths uh, that are, there are truths in logical systems. Uh, there are statements that are true, but they're not theorems. You can't prove them. Uh, okay, but uh, that's just a footnote. The basic idea now for the computational theory of the mind is you can operate with the syntax. Okay, now how do you do it? Well, this is, this is point number one, syntax and semantics. The next point is we need to introduce a notion that you should know anyway, and that's the notion of an algorithm. An algorithm is any set of procedures that is guaranteed to give you the right answer if you follow the procedures correctly. The procedures must be finite. It cannot, an algorithm cannot have an infinite set of steps but a, an algorithm, if carried out correctly, guarantees you the correct answer to a question. So for elementary arithmetic, there is an algorithm. If you follow the steps in the algorithm, you will get the right answer to arithmetical questions. Unfortunately, not all of life's problems have algorithmic solutions. Falling in love with the right person, no one has yet discovered the algorithm for that. But stay with elementary arithmetic. Addition and subtraction, yes. Uh, there are algorithms for doing it right. And if you follow the steps, you'll get the right answers. Now, why is that so important? I'm supposed to be talking about the mind here, and I'm talking about syntax, semantics, and algorithm. Well, the next great invention is, the next great notion is the notion of a Turing machine. Now, a Turing machine is an idea invented by a great British uh, logician and philosopher named Alan Turing. Tragic life, incidentally. Law, what, forced to suicide because of his homosexuality. I'll let you track it down on Google. It's a, a, a ridiculous life. That, I never met the guy, but I knew uh, people who knew him. Uh, but in any case, Alan Turing was a great genius, and among his many inventions was the idea of a Turing machine. A, the, a Turing machine is a machine that operates with only two types of symbols. It uses a binary symbolism, uh, uh, and these are usually thought of as zeros and ones, but any two symbols would, would do. They could be Chinese symbols or different states of uh, voltage in the computer. A Turing machine is a machine that operates with two different kinds of symbols, with a binary symbol system uh, and a program. The Turing machine has to have a set of rules for manipulating the symbols. However, the Turing machine is stunning in its simplicity. The rules, there are only four types of rules. The rules, there's a, a tape that moves through the Turing machine, and then there's a head that scans the tape. And the, and the instructions to the head are, 
move one square to the right, move one square to the left, erase a zero and uh, print a one, erase a one and print a zero. That's it. That's all you need for the Turing machine. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because the ordinary computers that you own are in effect Turing machines. Now, I have to qualify that immediately. The notion of a Turing machine is not a notion of a machine in an ordinary sense. You cannot go into a store and say, I want to buy a Turing machine, uh, because a Turing machine is a purely abstract mathematical idea. Uh, it has an infinite amount of tape. It has an infinite memory, and no machine has that. Uh, computers that I buy in stores are subject to all kinds of problems. I poured uh, inadvertently a glass of beer on a brand new laptop I once had, and I had a hell of a time explaining it, why I still needed them to honor the warranty. They did. They said, well, if you have problems, it's likely to occur in the first week. That's when I poured the beer. It was good beer, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, a real Turing machine, you can't pour beer on it. You don't have to worry that it's going to rust or you're going to drop it on the floor. A uh, Turing machine is a purely abstract notion. Well, but it has a notion of a machine that operates by manipulating symbols, by manipulating symbols that are of two kinds, zeros and ones. Now again, and, they, and it just goes back and forth according to the program with these zeros and ones. Now again, why is that so important? Well, it is important because it turns out that any algorithm at all, anything that has an algorithmic solution can be implemented on a Turing machine. The, the, binary, uh, the system of binary symbols is sufficient by itself to implement uh, any algorithm at all. So for any algorithm, there's some Turing machine that will implement that algorithm. Now, why is that important? Well, what it says in sort of mathematical jargon is that any computable function, any function that you can compute in mathematics is Turing computable, and that any uh, uh, a, a Turing machine system will be able to carry out any algorithm. And that uh, also has a name that's called Church's Thesis after Alonzo Church and it's sometimes called the Church-Turing thesis. It's a thesis and not a theorem because the notion of an algorithm isn't a precise enough notion to admit of a theorem. But I don't know any mathematician who would deny Church's thesis that any algorithm at all, any computable function you can do with a Turing machine. A Turing machine is rich enough, it has a rich enough apparatus uh, to carry out any algorithmic program. Now there's another idea I want to introduce in connection with a Turing machine, and that is the idea of a universal Turing machine. Most of the uh, computers that you have in your car are specialized. They're specialized for things like uh, measuring the rate of uh, gasoline consumption or uh, measuring uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, um, the, uh, the efficiency of the cooling system. They're special purpose computers. But Turing proved there is a universal Turing machine that can simulate any other Turing machine. So uh, to put this more carefully, for any Turing machine at all, there is a universal Turing machine that can simulate that Turing machine, that can carry out the programs of that Turing machine. Uh, okay, so you got the idea then. There are these algorithms, and uh, when you uh, write them down, uh, they turn out to be computer programs. I, they can be implemented on Turing machines, and indeed, there is a Turing machine that is so powerful that it can implement any algorithm at all. Now remember, this is abstract mathematics. You're not, don't, don't go into a store and say, you guys didn't sell me a universal Turing machine, you just sold me an ordinary apple. I want a universal Turing machine. It's an abstract mathematical idea. But the important point is, for practical purposes, the ordinary laptop that you are busy messing around with in class when you ought to be concentrating on the lecture and you're busy doing your uh, email or whatever, that is a universal Turing machine because there's no limit on the uh, number of programs that it can implement. Okay, and now then, we've got, uh, the reason that this is all so exciting is it turns out anything, any computable 
function. Is Turing computable? Any algorithm at all can be implemented on a universal Turing machine. Now, why is that so exciting? Well, here is the idea that sent shivers up and down the spines of testosterone-laden uh, intellectuals like yourselves about 30 or 40 years ago is maybe we are all universal Turing machines. Maybe the brain is a universal. Even I feel shivers when I say maybe the brain is a universal Turing machine. Now, why is that so exciting? Well. We've solved all the philosophical problems of the past 2,000 years. People wondered, how can the mind affect the body? Uh, how can we get the connection between the mind and the body? We know the answer to that. It's the relation between a program and the hardware implementation. But that's a problem we solve on a practical basis every day, thousands of times in this very university. It's just not a mystery to us. So, I mean, and you have to go back and read the old books of that era. They're all out of print now, I suppose, but there were a whole lot of books that all had more or less the same title. They were either were called Computers and the Mind or Mind and Computers. And then there were variations on that, and you can look them up. And one of my favorites is by a, a, a guy at Rutgers named Zenon Polition, and I wish I had memorized the sentence. It's a gorgeous sentence where he says, after 2,000 years of fruitless philosophical speculation, we now know the answer to how mental processes can affect behavior. The way they do it is that mental processes are states of a physical symbol system. That's a fancy word for computer. And they affect the, uh, the body the same way the states of any computer system affect the other states of the computer system. And you should look this stuff up uh, because it was a wonderful era, if I, if I can escape my, if I can get out of my snake here. Uh, and the guy's name is Zenon Polition one of those Polish names with lots of Y's. Pilishin. Yeah. Uh, Zenon, and the first name is Zenon. And look up his book. Uh, and it's one of these books. It's either Mind and Computers or Computers and Mind. Uh, one, of the, one of the permutations. Uh, and it, this was a wonderful, optimistic era. OK, we keep going. Now. I've given you a whole bunch of great ideas. Syntax and semantics, algorithm. Turing machines, see, the Turing machine need only operate with syntax. You don't have to worry uh, about uh, the interpretation because that's imposed. You can decide to program any idea you want, provided only that you can specify it as a finite set of steps in a precise enough vocabulary that it is implementable on a Turing machine, that it's Im implementable in a uh, uh, a system capable of operating with binary symbols. Now, how the hell does it work so well? Well, I'm always stunned by that, but the fact is it works well because your modern computer can do literally millions of operations per second. In a second, it can carry out millions of these steps. I always say that in lectures. I'm not sure I believe it, but I do do it every day with my damn computers. But in any case, that is the reason it's so effective, is that you get a very rapid set of computational processes. OK, now then, we need a test. Uh, we need a test for whether or not we are effort to create a mind has actually created a mind. And once again, Turing to the rescue. Turing invented something called the Turing test. And the Turing test, leaving out various details, says, look, if the behavior of the computer is such that an expert can't tell the difference between the computer's answer to the questions and a human answer to the questions, then you have to say, that the computer has the same cognitive capacity as the human. So if you design a computer program that can answer questions in Chinese as well as a native Chinese speaker, then you have to say, it would just be superstition to deny this, you have to say that the computer program, or more strictly the implemented computer program, can understand Chinese. 
The Turing test, in short, is a form of behaviorism. It says if it behaves like a duck and walks like a duck and acts like a duck, it's a duck. And what the Turing test says is if anything that can simulate the behavior of a human being so accurately that an expert can't tell the difference between the uh, behavior of the computer, the success of the computer, and a human being, then you have to say the computer has the cognitive capacities of the human being. It has an equivalent cognitive capacity. So we got five ideas out here. Syntax, semantics, algorithm, Turing machine, Church's thesis, and the Turing test. Now we're going to show how it might actually work in the human brain. Uh, so let's stop for questions. I don't know if this is fun or not, but anyway, it, it's, these are important ideas. You ought to know this kind of stuff quite apart from philosophy. Uh, you won't be a, 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 a fully a citizen of your culture if you don't know what a Turing machine is and what an algorithm is and what the Turing test is. This is part of general culture. Uh, okay, but questions about what I said so far? Yes. Hang on, I got to get closer. Uh, my hearing isn't all that great anymore, so you have to shout loud. Yeah. How does it explain what? Learning. learning. Okay. Uh, what happens in learning is that you reprogram. Uh, I, I, you can alter uh, the program, or you can introduce new programs. Now, you have to have a learning program in, to enable you to learn. So the learning program enables you to learn Chinese. But of course, once you learn Chinese, then you have got the Chinese uh, understanding program. So you can have programs that operate on programs. Now, there are complexities to this. Some people thought, well, the problem uh, with the brain is that it's, if it's a regular digital computer, it's too slow. I mean, there's a, uh, what's called the 100-step rule. Uh, the brain is so slow that it can only carry about, uh, uh, out about 100 computational, if it were a digital computer, 100 steps uh, in a half a second. But, <laughs> A hundred steps is nothing. Anybody who programs a computer knows you can't do anything interesting with a hundred lines of computer programming. I have a friend who works for Xerox, and he said that a really good Xerox machine has half a million lines uh, of computer programming, you know, the kind that will uh, 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 print on both sides and then staple it and all that kind of stuff. That takes a lot of computer programming. So it looks like the brain can't do much. Yeah, if it really is a conventional digital computer. Aha, but there's another theory to the rescue, and that is it's not a, a, a linear digital computer. It's a special kind of a computer that uses parallel distributed processing. That's another magic word, PDP. We'll get to that. Okay, nowadays we're still back in the 1970s and 80s with, uh, with the idea that whatever else the brain is, it's a digital computer. And some people even said, look, the fact that neurons either fire or don't fire, they're either on or off, that proves we're digital, you see? Because fire, don't fire, that's like zero and one. That's evidence that we are, in fact, digital. This guy, then that guy. You're, you're next. Yeah. Well, human error can arise because you got a bug in the program, or you may have a fault in the hardware. You had too much to drink, and that affected uh, the hardware. But these are kind of details. You know, if all, the only problem with this theory is, well, you guys have got to better explain how I'm so dumb at doing long division. Uh, they wouldn't think that's not our big worry. Uh, so, but they do have answers to that. Again, I, I'm in a position of Voltaire trying to explain the Catholic Church with this. I'm trying to make it seem plausible. I don't believe that the brain is a digital. I mean, I just think it's, well, well I'll get to my objections. Uh, you're going to hear more of them than you ever wanted to hear. OK, yes. Yeah. If this was the criteria, then they would be more developed than we would be this this many complications. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, the question is, uh, how is it that, they, uh, that the people, that people and animals like honeybees can be so smart if they have such a simple uh, computational mechanism, if the machine uh, is such a simple machine, right? Okay, we're going to get to that. And there, uh, uh, there, uh, there is a key notion. It's recursive decomposition. I love these fancy words with a lot of syllables. We'll get to that. It's about, you're five minutes away from recursive decomposition. Yes? This seems to apply really well to purely logical mental processes yeah. like math and yeah. logic, but what about feelings about art? And yeah, and yeah. I don't see how that could possibly go through. Uh, this was a standard objection at the time. I'll repeat it for people at the back. It seems to work well uh, for mathematics, uh, but how about uh, emotions? And how about art? How about aesthetic reactions? A, a fair summary of the question. And this was a standard objection. And there was always an argument against the computational theory of the mind that said, the computer can do x and y, but it can't do z. And then followed your favorite thing. It, the computer can do arithmetic and logic, but it can't fall in love. Or it can't um, feel the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism, or whatever is your, whatever is your your favorite feeling. The, fe the idea was the computer is pretty good, but there's that last little bit that the computer can't do. I, I think that's a, not a, a serious objection of these guys, because what they did was immediately uh, try to get computers that could do that last little thing. Some people said, well, uh, the computer can't write poetry. Immediately they uh, produced programs that could write poetry. It wasn't very good, but still, who am I to uh, say that? <laughs> uh, to be a, 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 you don't want to think you can defeat these guys with literary criticism. Um, and, and furthermore, they'd say, yeah, but it can't fall in love. Oh, yeah? Well, we can get a computer that says, I love you, and uh, says all the things that, <laughs> that you want the computer to say. You can program, and you can even program your computer to say, I am suffering the angst of post-industrial computers under late capitalism. Why not? Uh, so anything you can program, you can get the computer to do. And if the Turing test is to be taken seriously, you might get somebody who was fooled in the thing. Oh, well, the computer really is uh, in love. Uh, there was a guy who invented a program uh, that would do a psychoanalysis. What's his name? Weizenbaum, right? Well, Joe Weizenbaum invented this. He went to do psychoanalysis. Uh, and it did with simple tricks. Uh, so it, it asked you certain questions. Uh, tell us about your family. And as soon as it heard the word mother, it would ask certain questions. How do you get on with your mother? It, it just did this. Uh, and whenever it didn't know what to say, it would say, tell us more, or something like that. It had a, a certain <laughs> gimmicks. It was a Mickey Mouse program. But the point is, a lot of people were fooled. Uh, um, Weizenbaum said that his secretary insisted on being alone with the program uh, <laughs> during the lunch hour. And occasionally, she'd come away in tears because of uh, the profound, profound insights that she'd got in the program. So you can get uh, programs to do all kinds of dumb things. The question is, what is the philosophical significance of that? And I haven't answered that yet. I'm, I'm telling you what these guys believe. Now, I think their conclusion is false, but the, but the ideas are not false. All this stuff that I've told you is all very powerful stuff. The distinction of syntax and semantics, the existence of algorithms, the fact that they're programmable on Turing machines, and the fact that any computable function uh, any algorithm at all can be implemented on a Turing machine. I think those are all true and all powerful ideas. It's just the conclusion they draw is the wrong conclusion. One more question, then I'll go on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the idea is that any uh, linguistic um, expression will be either a, a, a primitive, that is undefinable, or more likely for complex expressions, you will be able to analyze it into simpler expressions. So you analyze complex feelings. If you are suffering the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism, uh, I, I don't suffer that angst, but a lot of my friends think I'm obviously a Philistine because they do suffer uh, that angst. Uh, then presumably you can analyze that into simpler feelings. And the idea is you break it down into the simplest components. And the 
earliest computational theories of language understanding were always like that. They always tried to break down uh, the, uh, the complex uh, linguistic ideas into simpler ideas. Uh, the guy who uh, uh, did a lot of work on that was Roger Schenck uh, at Yale. Uh, it didn't work uh, for a reason I'm going to tell you when we talk about language, but the, uh, the, that was the idea that you're going to analyze, uh, as with any computer program, you analyze the complex ideas into simple elements. Okay, let's go on. The next great idea on this list of seminal ideas of the uh, last half of the 20th century is the idea that in any of these systems there are levels of description and in any physical system you have to be able to think you have to be able to describe it at different levels at the top level you might say uh, I own a, a Volvo station wagon but of course there are lower levels of description where you describe the body its shape uh, the paint then there are lower levels of description of that where you talk about uh, the particular components of the uh, carburetor and then finally you get down to the lowest level which would be the physical particles uh, which would be uh, the specific molecules and subatomic particles that go uh, to make up the engine. Uh, any system of any complexity all, uh, at all will have different levels of description. And the levels of description, the idea that the same system admits of different levels of description is important because a system can be described in the same way as another system at a higher level, even though at a lower level they're quite different. So uh, you might have the same program as a computer, and at that level of description you're implementing the program, but at a lower level of description you have a different hardware structure. The computer is made out of silicon, I, and you are made out of various uh, types of organic molecules. So the reason that levels of description is important uh, for this particular discussion is because of a next notion. I've run out of numbers here. What am I up to? We were up to about five, four, five. Well, I'll let you, if you're, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is six levels of description. Okay. Then the reason that's important is because of multiple realizability. The same higher level phenomenon can be realized in different physical substrates. And indeed, uh, there is a diagram that you always see in the textbooks that look, looks like this. At this level, from A to B, you have the same description. We're implementing the same program, but there's lots of different hardwares for implementing that. There's C and D and E and F and G. So at the level of description A to B, these systems are all the same because they're all implementing the same program, but they have different hardwares. And you're all familiar with this. Uh, both the, uh, the uh, Macintosh and the PC can implement the word program. This will be the word program, and this will be the different hardware implementations. And the idea now is that at one level of description, you are implementing the same program as another person or as another computer, even though at a lower level of description, that has a different hardware realization. How is that possible? It's possible because this, of this wonderful feature of multiple realizability. The same program can be realized in an indefinitely large range of different hardwares. It can be realized in a, an indefinitely large range of different hardwares provided only that each of them has a level of description where they're implementing the same program. So the physics can be different 
even though the computational level is exactly the same. Now, I hope you see where this is leading. The idea is we have minds, but our minds are computer programs. I, at the level of description where we say, I'm thinking about my income tax, uh, I uh, am at the same level of description as a computer that I programmed to work on my income tax, even though that level of description is implemented in me in one way and in the computer in another way. It's got a different computer hardware. So levels of description is essentially tied to the notion of multiple realizability. Now there's one other notion uh, that's crucial. I want to introduce that and then we'll uh, and then I'll stop for question. And that is, I, I, I love all these fancy expressions. This is one is recursive decomposition. How is it that we are so smart? How is it that, for example, we can solve problems uh, in arithmetic? And the answer is because we are parts of a computer system, or rather we have in our brain a computer system which can break complex problems down into simple problems and solve them one at a time. So if you ask me, how is it that I multiply 371 and 582? I mean, if I was going to do that, well, the answer is I consciously go through a series of simpler steps. But while I'm consciously going through those steps, my brain is even going through even simpler steps, remember, at the rate of several million uh, per second. So if you ask, how does the, uh, the, your pocket calculator, how does it multiply 7 times 8 to get 56? Well, the first part of the answer might be, well, look, it takes uh, a 7 and adds it to itself seven times. They always say eight times, but that's bad arithmetic. You start with seven anyway. Uh, OK, so you, uh, you reduce uh, multiplication to addition. And how does it multiply seven plus seven? Well, first it com uh, converts seven into binary symbols. It converts it into a bunch of zeros and ones. And then it just operates on, uh, them, on them, one plus one plus one. Nothing more complicated than that. So the complex task of multiplying 7 times 8 is reduced to a series of very simple tasks, adding 1 plus 1. That's all the computer needs to do, is simple operations on binary symbols, on two, uh, uh, two symbols. And that means that the complex task can be decomposed, that's the decomposition part, into simpler tasks. And you do it over and over. You keep asking, how do you do that? How do you do that? Until finally you get to the simplest level, which is the level of zeros and ones. And those steps whereby you go from the more complex to the less complex, that's called recursive, because you do it over and over again. You go through the, uh, the reduction over and over. So the reason we're so smart is because the actual complex tasks that we think are so smart, like composing a work of philosophy or uh, uh, writing a term paper, those decompose into simpler tasks and those decompose into simpler tasks until recursively we get down to where the work is really done. One plus one, print a zero, erase a one, move one square to the left. Everything reduces by recursive decomposition of the simplest type of complex operations. OK, now unless you understand this stuff that I've been telling you, you're really not a fully intellectual uh, citizen of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the century. Now, that doesn't mean you can forget about uh, Baudelaire and James Joyce. You've got to understand them, too. But that's not today's lecture, OK? I'm not talking about, yes, Baudelaire. Oh, you prefer Rambo? OK, Rambo and Baudelaire. Uh, but in any case, uh, we're, uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff. But this is necessary that you should understand these. However. Though I think all this stuff I told you is, is well, up to a point it's valid. Uh, recursive decomposition's got some problems, the way I characterized it. But here is uh, the next step. How does the mind work? I have given you the machinery for answering that question. Uh, the mind is a universal Turing machine. Programs 
or rather a set of programs implemented in the brain and the brain then is able to carry out complex tasks because the complex tasks are recursively decomposable into the primitive computational operations that are all in binary symbols or all zeros and ones. We have a test for telling whether or not we have succeeded in creating a mind. It is the Turing test and any system that passes the Turing test uh, will have a mind in exactly the same sense uh, that uh, each of us has minds. And you don't have to worry about the specific hardware that you're in because I, I, your mind is multiply realizable. This is why Ray Kurzweil can say we're going, we ought to all get uh, uploaded onto uh, a decent hardware and get out of this realization we got because it's messy and it decays and it dies and all that and a better hardware won't. So there, out of all of this comes an equation which was uh, the guiding light of a certain conception of the mind and of cognitive science. The equation was the mind is to the brain as the program is to the hardware. We know how programs are inter implemented in hardwares. We know how the same program can be implemented in an indefinitely large range of different hardwares. Well, that's the key to understanding the mind. One of the many advantages to this theory is it turns out you don't have to know how the brain works to know how the mind works. Uh, my friends who do uh, artificial intelligence programming are rather proud of the fact that they can't fix the damn computer when it breaks down. I, you know, I say, come on, you're a professor of computer science, what's going on here? That, that's for plumbers, you know, call an electrician. I do serious intellectual work. I do work at this abstract level of the Turing machine program. So if it's right, that if this equation is right, that the mind is to the brain, uh, as the program is to the hardware, then you can study the mind independently of knowing how the brain works. And this was, and the, a lot of this was were important ideas in the early days, in the founding days of cognitive science, <laughs> because the question was, how are you going to do cognitive science if you don't know how the brain works? And a comforting answer was, you don't have to know how the brain works, uh, because the brain just happens to be. Uh, the material in which we're implemented, but any physical system would do. We just happen to be implemented in a, uh, uh, in, in a certain type of hardware system, but any hardware system that can carry the programs, uh, because of multiple realizability, uh, any hardware systems that can compare the programs, that can carry the programs, will be equivalent will have a level of description where it has the same cognitive capacities that I have or that you have. Now, just to have a label, I call this, when I first wrote about it, I call it strong artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence was the effort uh, uh, to create computer programs that could uh, do what in humans we would think of as intelligent behavior. And strong AI, I characterize as the view that, as this view, this is a summary of, of strong AI, that all there is to having a mind is having the right computer program, a computer program uh, that can carry out the algorithms in such a way as to pass the Turing test. But again, I want to emphasize how this seemed to give a wonderful research program for cognitive science. You design a computer program, and if you get the computer to carry out what humans can do, you've now got a theory. You've got a theory of human cognition because the theory is what the uh, uh, computer is doing and what the brain is doing are the same at some level of description, at the program level. How do you know you've got the right program? Because there are different programs that could uh, carry out, it could give this result. And there you call in the psychologists and what they do is to try to see if 
the program that the brain is carrying out is the same as the program that the computer is carrying out. And they did this with their favorite research tool at the time was called a reaction time experiments. And the idea was if the delays in the human cognition match the delays in the computer, I mean, pretty small delays for the computer. But anyway, if you get reaction time experiments that show uh, that the type of reaction times that humans have uh, uh, mimic or are isomorphic with or similar to the reaction times that the computer has, you have good evidence that the computer gives you a theory of human cognition. It gives you a theory of what uh, the brain is actually doing. So you've got a wonderful research program. You don't have to know how uh, the uh, brain actually works as a hardware system. Who cares about the uh, number of carbon rings in serotonin or the, uh, the structure of the Perkin J cells? I mean, that, leave that to the plumbers. Leave that to those brain stabbers. Uh, we will do serious, hard-nosed uh, cognitive science, and that consists in designing computer programs that can pass the Turing test, and then we get our psychologists to do reaction time experiments to see if the humans are actually using the same programs as the computer. If they are, the <laughs> computer program is more than just a program, it's a theory. We now have a theory of human cognition. We can show you uh, with actual uh, demonstrations that this is how human cognition works. Uh, it is a wonderful idea. It is false in almost every respect. Uh, and I, I couldn't resist pointing this out uh, in an article I wrote in 1980, which you're going to have to read. And I think at last I'm now beginning uh, to convince these people. I, the evidence is this. I have in the past year been invited to address uh, two large international gatherings of artificial intelligence experts. At one point, I remember the Artificial in jour Journal said, the main purpose of artificial intelligence right now is to refute Searle. Uh, <laughs> some years ago, I thought, well, you know, that's not bad. Um, I, have we got time? I see people uh, starting to, uh, but I, by my clock, we seem to have a couple more minutes. I can cover a lot of ground in a couple minutes. So don't snap your notebooks yet. Okay, a couple more minutes. Okay, so this is strong artificial intelligence, and I've now carried you through the g great dramatic sequence that goes from Descartes to what people thought was the culmination of the philosophy of mind, the computational theory of the mind. I baptized it as strong artificial intelligence. Weak artificial intelligence, I just said, was a theory. You can use the computer to study the mind the way you use a computer to study anything. Just about any department in this university uh, in the sciences has to use computational modeling, whether it's soil science or uh, cell biology. They use computers all the time. So uh, my, the definition of weak artificial intelligence was uh, you can uh, use the uh, a computer to study the mind as you can use it to study anything. You don't make any strong claims to the effect that the computer is a mind. By the way, as a piece of rhetoric, I should never have labeled these strong and weak because none of these guys wanted to be said to be weak. You know, whatever they thought of themselves were not wimps. Uh, so that was an unfortunate. I just meant it, when philosophers say strong and weak, they mean uh, the theory is more likely to be false if it's the stronger theory. The weaker theory is the one that's likely to be true. I think weak artificial intelligence is true. Strong artificial intelligence is false. Okay, and I'm going to tell you on Tuesday why it's false. But I got to tell you a lot of other crap first. Okay, I'll see you on Tuesday. <laughs>